let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship this morning as we listen to the prelude and process with the life of Christ. <laughs> now the call to worship. Let us hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from our sins and blot out all our iniquities. Create in us a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within us. Do not cast us away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from us. Restore to us the joy of your salvation and sustain in us a willing spirit. Let us pray. Almighty God, you alone can bring into order our unruly wills and affections. Grant your people grace to love what you command and desire what you promise, that among the swift and varied changes of the world, our hearts may surely there be fixed where true joys are to be found. Amen. Let us continue our worship this morning by joining in for the beauty of the earth.
hear now these words from Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 34. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. Just a reminder, if you haven't dropped off your offering in the plates, um, to go ahead and do so at the end of the service. Let us join in praise of that offering by singing the doxology, and you may stand. let us come before the Lord in prayer. Almighty God, we are so blessed, as the scripture says, to have your word, your covenant written on our hearts, in our lives, leading us, showing us which way to go, guiding us into a deeper walk with you. Lord, we thank you for the blessing of being present in our lives. And we thank you for all of the gifts that you have blessed us with that come with your spirit and your presence. Gifts of time, of talent, of resources, gifts too many to name or number. Lord, we ask that you use these gifts, the giver and those who cannot give at this time, so that the world may know you and may experience your covenant written on their hearts through our lives, actions, sacrifices, and giving. Lord, this morning we also offer to you our prayers. We lift them up before you that you may take them into your hands and that you may provide comfort where comfort is needed that you may provide healing where healing is needed, that you may provide grace and love and wisdom and all of those things which your bounteous love supplies. Lord, especially this morning, we lift before you Dave as he goes for some more testing in order to help sort out the heart issues that he's having. We lift before you Valerie as she deals not only with the pain and the difficulty of illness, but the added stress of not knowing why. So Lord, we ask that you grant wisdom, especially to the doctors and the nurses and those who are working to find out why she is ill. We lift before you Karen's family as they process their grief and as they move toward a time of celebrating her life and remembering her passing. We ask that you keep peace and grace and your presence, especially at the forefront during that time. Lord, we lift before you those who are on our prayer list situations where you know details 
even if we do not know the extent of what's going on. We lift before you all of those who need your presence. We also lift before you this day the unspoken requests on our hearts and minds. You are aware, because you are in our lives, Lord, you are acutely aware of what it is that we need. And so, Lord, we come before you this day, lifting these all into your hands for your care and for your gift of great love in each circumstance. And we do this all in the name of Jesus Christ, the one who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us continue our worship by joining in And Can It Be? know about most of you but 
If I am trying to remember something, I write it down. Or I record it in some way, shape, or form. I used to be a very big proponent of sticky notes, and I still use those quite a bit. Now I'm also prone to texting myself so that the little notification appears in the corner and I remember what it was that I needed to do. I know some people do voice memos and everyone has their own system, but the fact is, is if we commit something to only our memories in our heads, no matter how good we are, unless we have the proverbial photographic memory, the likelihood is we still need some system to write something down so that we don't forget it. The people of God had written commandments. They had the Ten Commandments and they had many other commandments that kind of explained and kind of continued on the imagery and the understanding of the Ten Commandments. They had written commandments and that was important for them. Up until the Ten Commandments, it was possible that there wasn't a lot of written history or a lot of written information. It was very rare that anyone would be able to read, let alone know what was written on something since paper wasn't common. It was a production to put something into stone or to produce any type of papyrus that they might be able to produce. And so it was important for the people of God that commandments were in writing because it helped them remember. While the people of God and oral history tellers of the time were really good at remembering general stories, they weren't so great on specific details. As you know, if you're telling a story, it's very hard to remember the exact details. You just remember the general gist of the story. And so for the people to have the commandments and other, com other types of commandments and law of God written down was very important. But like the rest of us humans, you write something down and you forget it anyway. <laughs> the times you've gone to the grocery store and the grocery list is on the table at home, <laughs> magnetized to the refrigerator, wherever it might be. You write a sticky note and you're like, I remember writing that sticky note, but I can't find that sticky note. Or you throw it away, you throw it away accidentally. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, it's stuck to something else, it's tucked in something else. We as humans, even though writing down things is an important part of memory, are also pretty forgetful with the notes that we write down. And the people of God were no exception. They had commandments written down practically as close as you can get to by God's hand. And Moses goes up on a mountaintop and receives them from God. And yet, they're still drifting away. Why? Because... We are human, we get distracted. And so God in Jeremiah is speaking through the prophet. Now, Jeremiah, like some of the prophets, have a tendency to be a mixture of information. Some of their prophecies are about what's coming. Some of their prophecies are about what to do now that's happened. And some of them are kind of a mixture of proclamations that people need to hear during that time that are just informational. Usually they're promises, usually they're supposed to encourage the people who might be in a rough spot. God is speaking through Jeremiah here in that kind of a context. Jeremiah is telling the people not so much a prophecy for the future, not so much a solution for their problem, but a promise about what God has for them. Now it is a bit of a future nature, he is talking about a time coming when, and we, where we are now, know that time coming doesn't actually achieve until Jesus. But he is telling the Israelites that no matter what happens, God's got this sorted out. And what God says through Jeremiah is that you have this covenant that you've broken, <laughs> that you've strayed away from, this written down covenant that you have promised to follow and yet have failed to do so, I'm going to do something different. I'm going to write this next covenant that's coming on your heart. 
Now, he's not literally talking about inscribing anything on anybody's internal organs. What he's actually talking about and what we know, because our context after Christ, is he's talking about the Spirit of God that we receive after Christ's coming. When Jesus said, I will send a spirit after me, and that spirit resides in our hearts. That's the reason he says no more will they need to look for God or tell others where to find God or have to teach them about this is where you find God. The Israelites were people that worshipped primarily in Jerusalem or at the temple. When that wasn't there, they had difficulty worshipping. They forgot what they were supposed to be doing. They met God in one particular place. God is saying that's not going to be necessary. You're all going to know me intimately when this time comes. So we as Christians have this promise that when we join up with God, whatever you want to call it, get converted, are born again, however you want to word that, meet Jesus Christ, Accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. Whenever that happens, God's Spirit literally resides in us. And it writes the Word. John says the Word was with God and the Word was God. He's talking about Jesus. Writes the Word of God on our hearts in our lives. Now, as we talked a couple weeks ago when we encountered the Ten Commandments, Sometimes when we hear the things that God's going to write his law on our hearts, we start getting going, oh, that means he's going to put restrictions on us. And I want to reaffirm that this is not what God intends. He doesn't want us to live a restricted life, but rather live a free life. Now, I know that some of you might be a little confused. How can you have the free life if someone's giving you all the guidelines? But I want you to think about it this way, and we're going to look at two possible examples. First, how many of you remember navigating with a map? How many of you were responsible for the map? <laughs> how many of you remember the challenge that it was if you got off course to figure out where you were on this paper map that unfolds out six feet in your car? How many of you remember the challenge that it was to go where you needed to go if you were uncertain where you were going because you constantly had to keep your eyes on the map. Now, how many of you have encountered GPS? Now, at this point, when you're using GPS, there's still a margin for error. It happens. There's still a possibility. But as long as you follow the directions and you inputted the information correctly, you'll get there eventually. And even if it decides to take you six miles around where you were originally going, you will get there. And if you know that it's locked in and it's a solid route, you now have freedom to enjoy your travel more. Now it's not a constant looking at the next road and the next road and the next road and counting miles to see when your next turnoff is just to get somewhere. Now you have the freedom to enjoy your surroundings, to sing along with the radio, to dance along with the radio, to listen to your audiobook, whatever it might be, to talk with the family, to play I Spy, to play Car Bingo, because you're not focused on the directions of the map. For the people of Israel, the, the commandments was the map. They had to keep constantly focused on it, had to keep constantly paying attention, had to keep always looking back to it. For the people of God now, it's more like GPS. We naturally are just told which way to go. No one has to be fiddling with a map. Another good example, and for those of you who know me, um, know a little bit of my secret, you know that I was an uh, engineer for the Lodi Station, now Ohio Station Outlets train, the two-foot scale train that ran around the outside of the mall. And there is something freeing about railroad tracks. Or if you've ever dri driven the little cars that ride on the rail at the amusement park, you really can't go off the rails overall. Again, humans, always a possibility. 
but overall you can relax. You can just be guided along by the track. You go where the track is taking you and you really can't divert far from that. Now, let me be clear with this example because we're humans. Yes, it is possible. Sometimes you get so in the zone, like I did when I was talking about the pavilion out the back corner of Lodi Station Outlets and you don't notice the inch size gravel rock on your track and you do derail a train. It is possible we're human, but isn't it so much better to travel on something that you already know where it's going and you already have a general sense of where you're headed and who's got you covered in terms of directions? Isn't it so much more freeing to be able to engage in what's going on around you instead of so busily fighting over whether you have taken the right path? There is something freeing about knowing who's in charge and where you're going. That's one less thing you have to worry about. That's one less thing you have to pay attention to, constant attention to, and more time to live your life in the space around you. Now, again, as we have acknowledged with both of our, both our GPS, and our train, there are times when things do get a little off track. We as humans, it's possible. God understands that. We do have to stay in touch with God's spirit. That's why we worship. That's why we read the Bible. That's why we pray. But it is so much more freeing to know God has written his word in our hearts. God's spirit is present with us and he's leading the way. Now, a whole different sermon can be preached, and I'm sure I've talked about it before, on our tendency to need to relinquish control to God, because that can be challenging. But today we focus on the promise. This is what Jeremiah is giving the people. The promise that God is going to be our guide from a private internal place and not from some set of rules that you have to try and keep up with. These words that God is speaking, these laws, these commands, these gifts of love God is giving to us to keep us on that right track reside in our hearts. There's no sticky note we can lose track of. There's no shopping list we can leave at home. There's no map we can forget in the luggage. There is only God's spirit in our lives. It takes out a lot of our human error first, and it adds to our life the ability to focus more on what's going on around us rather than worry about all the nitpicky details of whether or whether or not we're walking with God. And even though we're not Israelites and we have not experienced the way that the Israelites and the people of God by the time Jesus came were nitpicky about the laws, we ourselves, if we begin to lose focus on God in us and we begin to feel like we have to search for him and look for him, we are, well, we're living a rougher life than we need to be, let's just put it that way. <laughs> and we're very familiar with that sense. There are times in our lives when we do that, when we forget God is guiding us internally and we become distracted and then it's all about, oh, I have to do this or I have to do that. And more often than not, we fail at that. So what we focus on is God in us, God's word, God's spirit, God's law, God's love in us, and let it guide us. If you think about it, if you trust someone, you're more likely to let them be around you and do things with you than if you don't. We all have the friend or two that we can trust to plan a blind event and no matter what they say, we know we'll be okay with it 
it will be comfortable, it will be fun, it will be enjoyable, we'll feel safe. And we all probably have that friend or family member that we do not trust to plan an event by themselves. Whether that may just be because they're massively disorganized, whether that may be because they'll do something that's gonna embarrass us, or whether that may be because they might get us into a situation that we are uncomfortable with, we all understand the freedom of trusting someone because we know their intentions, we know what they're guided by, we know their morals, we know their personality, versus not trusting someone with that much freedom because we know all those things about them. This is the same way we operate. We are much more free in our lives to do the things we need because we are centered in Christ. When we become focused, when we become driven by God, we are able to be trusted. We are able to be freer to live lives where others don't go, boy, they're going to get off track real fast. <laughs> We know that person, when left to their own devices, you know, off we go. Sometimes that's us. Sometimes that's us, we don't want to admit it. So when we internalize God, when we take that spirit inside of us and we nurture that spirit in us, we become much freer to live lives where we know we're not going to go off the rails as often as if left to our own choices and left to our own des desires. And so Jeremiah here is speaking a word of promise to the Israelites. And even though the event has already happened for us as Christians, a word of promise for us, for all the times when we fall away and we focus on the words and forget to live the Spirit. The promise is that God has created this new covenant with us where he has placed himself, his word, his love, his law, his promise in our hearts. And if we follow that, we are much more free to live godly lives. The song that we will close with, I am thine, O Lord, is, it's, the whole song is about drawing nearer to God, drawing closer and closer to him. The, one of the lines is, let my will be lost in thine. In other words, let my will and your will be so inseparable that you can't tell the difference, that it gets lost in there. This is the type of relationship God wants when he says he's going to write the covenant on their hearts and they will always know him that our wills and our lives may be so entwined and so lost in God's that he won't be able to see the difference. And so let this truly be a prayer to, for God to draw us nearer to himself and to draw our attention to his presence in our lives. Let us join now in singing, I am thine, O Lord.
receive now the benediction. Now may you go out with God's promise of his word written on your heart. And may your will and his will be so entwined that he lives in you and that you are free to share with others the covenant and promise of his love living in them. Amen and amen. Have a blessed week. Be safe.